Hi, Jen. Thank you. Good morning. Hi, Malcolm. Good to be here. Good to have you as well. Um, so, Jen, uh, would you be able to like, uh, because I did a very brief introduction, right? Uh, but I think our listeners would like to know more about you um, before before we even uh, jump into our today's topic, uh, corporate culture, workplace pulse in small business. So would you able to share a little bit more with our audience? Like, uh, actually, we would like to know um, a bit of your journey, you know, like how actually you started everything and a bit of background of who you are as well. Sure. Uh, I think you actually have given a very good introduction. You covered many other bases. Uh, but I think one interesting thing about me is that uh, I'm actually not an entrepreneur. Uh, I didn't come from an entrepreneur background. Right? This means that during my college days and my uni days, I, I was actually a programmer. I'm a technically trained person, so I do a lot of programming. I do a lot of coding. I have zero experience in business. But somehow, something sparked in me at the age of 17 in college where I just wanted to be very honest. I just wanted to have a nicer CV than my friends. That was how my entrepreneurship journey started. I actually considered all the different options to stand out from my friends, right? So I looked at whether I should join certain clubs in uni, you know, become a president of something and maybe stand out from there. Maybe I should get a perfect CGPA, become a valedictorian, dean's list and all that things. Uh, or maybe maybe even to even get a part-time job, you know, become a barista, you know, do something, just get some real life experience. But then at that age, I also thought to myself, these are things where my friends or my peers could also achieve if they wanted to, you know. So I started thinking to myself, what is it that can really set me apart? And I thought maybe I should do something with what I'm learning right now. And that was my starting point. So I started I, asking myself questions like, since I'm doing an IT degree, you know, what can I do with my IT skills? And I thought, okay, maybe I would try setting up a computer shop, like literally to sell computer hardware. And uh, I didn't have the budget to do it. Uh, I come from a very average Malaysian family. My allowance back then in college was only about 300 ringgit per month. I don't know how I survived that, not honestly, right now. But uh, that was really how I started, right? So I started off by literally providing services for my friends, by formatting their PCs, trying to optimize the softwares they're using. I charge 5 ringgit, 10 ringgit. Eventually, this business grew. In fact, the interesting thing is that about... Six months in, because remember, it's about two semesters in, I didn't actually realize I was running a business until one of my friends came by and said, hey, Jen, this business that you're doing, not bad. Huh? Then I started thinking to myself, you know, from that on, business, huh? you are right. It, it, it is a business, you know? So I'm kind of like an accidental entrepreneur. I've never looked back ever since, right? So from then on, the business scale, uh, I didn't went on to actually start the computer store. Halfway through, I realized that that dream was a little bit silly uh, because I wasn't aware of the competition. I didn't study how is the industry like, how much does it cost to start a shop. I, I didn't know these things, right? So I pivoted. I went to data recovery and that was actually my first successful uh, pivot. Through data recovery, we got acquired five years in uh, as this particular company. And then I started seven other businesses uh, along the pipeline, whether it's in fashion, whether it's in Facebook app development, whether it's in events, whether it's in consultancy. And of course, one of it right now is uh, Open Minds, a MarTech consultancy firm that's been around for the past eight years. Lots of ups and downs. Uh, culture is a topic that we hold very closely to heart because that's something we pay attention to from the very beginning. Uh, right now, we operate from three countries, Malaysia, Singapore, and Hong Kong. So yeah. That's a brief insight towards what I'm doing. Or maybe for some of you that are also in interested to know that my parents were actually not supportive of my entire entrepreneurship journey until that point where you mentioned just now, Malcolm, in 2017, when I made the Forbes under 30 list and my parents started seeing my pictures in the newspaper and then one day they turned around and said, Agent, not bad huh, what you're doing. That's all they said, not bad. And I finally got a pat on my back after so many years of entrepreneurship. Right. So, I mean, that kind of feeling of the, a pat in the back, right? Like, after how many years that you venture into something that you are not even certain or not even sure, because um, doing business or being an entrepreneur, it's also, uh, and, and it's also considered as an 
adventure, right? Like uh, you don't know what's ahead of you, but you still need to like, let's move forward, right? And, and let's see what, what can we plan on what we know. And uh, from there, we, we build slowly, um, uh, step by step, right? So as you mentioned about, I mean, we, because of our topic today is about corporate culture. So um, when you thought about the culture of, uh, for the company, how actually you, you, you come, uh, how do you come about with that with, your, with yourself first, right? Then only with your team or your core team. Mm -hmm. um, how, how do you actually uh, put that into your own drawing board? Like, like you, you imagine like how you want it to be or, or is there any kind of uh, steps that you do before you, you put on to and like implementing it? Mm. So the interesting thing about how we implemented culture is that uh, we didn't have a very fixed structure to this, right? So if you're expecting me to say step one, this is what we did, step two, that's what we did, that, that didn't happen at all. But what happened was actually through a conversation, right? So what happened was that uh, we we're going to start this company and when the founders came together, me and uh, four others, when we sat down, we were very aware that we didn't want to just build a company like any company out there. I mean, yes, I mean, everybody here will probably be very familiar with the startup process, right? You build a product, you go MVP, you validate it and do all that kind of stuff. But we know that after all that, then what? That was the question that we we're trying to resolve. And we are very certain that, hey, we just don't want to be another startup that looks good, you know, from the outside with a cool logo, a cool name, a cool office, and people will just admire us from the outside. And we even more didn't like the concept of having so-called, uh, quote-unquote, a cold corporate culture where you see this, you know, in the boardroom, there's this big poster talking about their values. Hey, we are A, B, C, you know, we are X, Y, Z. And we think that this is, pardon my word, but it's like kind of crap, right? Like, your people here doesn't behave that way. So we're very aware of these other kind of like the challenges that we face at that point of time. So what we did is that we jumped into really a session of dreaming. Like we literally go one round, plenty of rounds in fact, just asking each other, what is the dream company like? Right, so everyone went on. So some were saying that, oh, you know, a dream company is that you can literally just walk in and walk out wherever you want, you know? Somebody will say, yeah, that's true. And uh, maybe performance is everything. You know, if you can get your things done and that's it, you know, a dream company will be shorter working hours. You're talking about how the company takes care of the people, how the behavior of the team members when they come in, how can we have a common goal? So this went on for quite a bit. And after which we then pick uh, different pieces of that dream together and started forming structures. And we asked ourselves, how can we, achieve some of these things and that led us to actually a whole bunch of things uh, that we have that have, we have kept since day one until today nine years later oh wow that's a that's a long that's a that's a very consistent and very long um uh period but since you say about carry on for nine years right so what what with, within these nine years is there any uh changes like uh, when it's just started and mm. then along the way in the mid section and then along the way to where it is today because of the pandemic. Um, mm. Is there any kind of uh, changes in between? That's a, a very good question. Uh, in fact, I would start off by answering the last bit of what you said, whether there's any change from the beginning to uh, until today as we are in the pandemic. Well, obviously there are some changes, but interestingly on hindsight, what I've also realized is that whatever that we've started out doing, that foundational cultural and values that we established have actually helped us survive the pandemic. So that, that's the beauty of what we have started. And it's only nine years later and we're like, hey, there must be something that we have done right, you know. Somehow things are falling into place even when the team is 100% decentralized uh, right now. But what happened was that I wouldn't say that there was a cultural shift. However, certain things has evolved because obviously when we are five men strong and somehow 30 people, 50 people strong with the amount of people coming in, things have shifted a little bit. Uh, the definition needs to be uh, some relaxed, some tightened, some added on. And what we have done is that I remember very clearly in our fourth year uh, anniversary, we actually got the team back then 
to contribute to forming the values of open minds. So we set the entire company down and told them, look, this company started with the dreams of just five of us. Now we want to hear your dream. Like what is the dream company? How is it like? Tell us everything. And we did the exact same activity. Interestingly, there were a lot of keywords that were also repeated, but this time there was a description to it. They will be able to more vividly describe like this is how it is. You know, when I come in, this is how my team members will behave. When I say certain things, this is how they respond. When we're in a team meeting, this is how we are supposed to interact. People cannot keep quiet. People should reply to the text, you know. So all these details start coming up. We were just frantically writing it down. And then after that, we started categorizing it into what we call the eight values of open minds. And since then, we have always been developing these eight values. Uh, by making it more relevant uh, in the things that we do or how uh, the new generation of people coming in. But that has become our foundational nature. And because of that, right, because of some of the things like where we said that we have, uh, one of our first values is to always start with why. We have another value that focuses on being positive. We have another value that talks about always creating value. Eight of them in total, how it helped us get ready for the pandemic is because of all the conversations that we're having, the mindset that we're able to establish from day one, the different structures that we have, even from an operational level, is able to help the company and the people within it still follow through why they are here in the first place. So that is how we, I would say, started off unintentional, but over the years, it became a lot more intentional of how we kind of manifest these cultural aspects and values into very tangible aspects of the business, especially operational, uh, the SOPs, and so on and so forth. May I ask, in the whole company, how many, uh, how many team members do you have? So currently in Malaysia, we are running about 30-ish, and then in Hong Kong at about 10. And uh, Singapore? Singapore is very small. Singapore, we only have two currently. Right. So you have people from Malaysia, um, I, I presume your 30 uh, over um, Malaysia, uh, yeah. he, uh, uh, headcount in Malaysia are Malaysians, right? Yes. Yeah. So then you have uh, people from Hong Kong. So uh, are they local, uh, local Hong Kong? Yes, uh, local. City, lo yep. Local Hong Kong, but not foreigners, right? No, but they're all local Hong Kong. Yep. All, okay. And uh, you have two Singaporean, right? Yes, that's right. All right. So with this, I mean, the, 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 um, geographically, we are different. Mm -hmm. but we are also quite close right mm -hmm. so um with this different um set of uh, teams right um how would you see the uh di is there any differences of culture um that are able to like is there any like managing a team in malaysia and managing the team in hong kong mm. um even two person in singapore uh i bet there's still a little bit of uh differences right so do you see the corporate culture or the culture that has been uh, initiated by yourself and your team, right, from the very beginning until now? Do you see any uh, similarity or they are still bound to have, uh, uh, you need to localize a little bit to the local, um, the, uh, local office? Mm. So that's, uh, that's where the beauty is, right? So when we talk about culture, Yes, the culture remains similar across every team that we, are, we have a presence in. However, when it comes to the description, like what I mentioned earlier, so the culture has eight values and the description of it and how it's being internalized and localized into operations, that's where the difference is. But when it comes to mindset of how we need to behave, how we treat others, how we treat our work, how we deliver our things, all this does not change. But the details of it, of how. So, for example, in Hong Kong, they're working from home is something where they don't really enjoy because of their homes are a bit small, they prefer to be out, they're a little bit more quicker, the way they communicate is very, very different. Their needs on a daily basis is very different from a Malaysian or Singaporean. So the execution-wise, when it comes to operations, it's a little bit different. But no matter how they localize some of this, uh, interests or behaviors to cater to the respective team members, they all come back to the same governing values and what the co company represents as the overall culture. So you're right. 
Singaporeans, although there's a very small team, the difference is there. Uh, although they are just across kind of like different <laughs> streets, right? But similarly, the mindset, the way they think, the needs are also different. But at the end, we can all agree that these are the values we want uh, our team members to have. These are the values we find important for the company to grow as well. I think that's where the difference is uh, with some other corporate cultures that we see out there over the years as well. Because we also recognize that some companies um, with the main corporate culture, let's say they are German company or whatnot, they will literally enforce lock, stock, and barrel across all the different subsidiaries around the world. So you all behave like how the headquarters in Germany or in Japan behaves, right? Nothing wrong with that. But what we found is that it doesn't work. And we realized that up front within our first year in Hong Kong, we literally tried to enforce, because we have been here in Malaysia for a while, right? And it's working very well for us. So we thought, all we need to do is just take what's good, plant it there, it should work, right? This is what scaling is supposed to be. <laughs> develop a working mechanism and the system, plant yep. it and it should work. But it did not. In fact, it failed very miserably. I started asking why, right? And then we realized that, hey, maybe it's time to have that same conversation with the team there over again. And we did the same thing, right? To again, get them to talk about the things. And then we realized, okay, the first thing that, we, that stood out very clearly to us, right, is that, hey, this bunch of people thinks it's different, right? So they're telling us very different situations. But actually, it can be all mapped to the same eight core values that we have. Just that somehow because of the description and words are a little bit different. So it made it seem as though there is a gap. So what we did was just to, okay, localization needs to happen. Same thing, reword it to their context reword it to the environment, their working style, their behavior, their own career and personal goals, their in daily lifestyle. And that worked. And then the same thing with Singapore uh, as well. In fact, at one point of time, we were in Kazakhstan and we did the exact same thing. But is the, is the office still, uh, is by any chance the office still going on in Kazakhstan or basically no. you just pull, pull yeah. the plug? So uh, we pulled the office uh, in 2017, if I'm not mistaken. We were there for two years. Uh, but in 2017, we had to pull because of the oil and gas crisis. Uh, ah, okay. with Kazakhstan is very dependent on the market. Mm. So mm. It, it didn't just, it didn't work out for us on the economic uh, side of things. Right. So you touched on a very uh, important word uh, as even though we're talking about culture, corporate culture, you, you touch on a very important word, which is mindset. Right. So so this mindset, like what we hear from you uh, about the whole um, the I think the way or the culture in your company, it's very um, modern. Uh, it's very. Uh, it's not the traditional uh, corporate companies or even uh, SMEs uh, uh, culture. So, do you think that the culture that you have uh, uh, cultivate in in this company is professionalism? Um, like, how do you define professionalism? Or have you ever gotten anyone that from outside? to come and question about professionalism of your, your, your teams? Well, when we talk about professionalism, right, obviously we are a company, not a social organization where people come and chat and have fun, right? So the level of professionalism or productivity uh, it is very much key. So that's why when we started mapping and started putting in structures to these cultures and value they have, there was a very important question uh, that we asked ourselves, right? We talked about priorities, which is very similar to the mindset thing. So we talk about priorities. What is a priority for the company and what is the priority for individuals? So this has to balance, right? So we talk about, okay, what is important in life? So we talk about people with value time for their family, they will value their growth within the company, they will value, of course, the monetary compensation they get from a company. But at the same time, from the company itself, we also need to have things like you need to be punctual, you need to respect people's time, you need to be accurate in your work, you need to be constantly innovating, you need to deliver value. Right? So I think it's a combination of these things that make up our definition of professionalism 
uh, within the space. Because I think many companies kind of misunderstand culture. I mean, the corporate companies understand it very well. That's why they have this whole corporate guidebook, right, that goes through every layer by layer. But they have their set of challenges. The startup side of the world, the, the definition of culture is also a little bit warped, right? Because culture becomes very just, very surface, where it's talking about, oh, uh, not coming, flexi work time is considered culture. Uh, a cool office is considered culture. Free food is good culture. Bean bags at work is culture. A lot of freebies is culture, you know? But that is to us just the outcome of what culture could manifest into. But there needs to be underlying values of why are you doing this thing? Why bean bags? Why free food? Why flexible? How, what are you trying to promote? So that's how we map certain things. So the few things that I mentioned just now, like time for family, punctuality, uh, productivity and all that, is act we actually have individual structures uh, in our operations to make sure it happens. For example, to force, the keyword here is force uh, team members to have equal amount of time and emphasis within their life, work, and their family, we actually develop what we call the Open Minds Perks, which is 24 categories of different budget set from your personal life. Like uh, we have a sports perk for you to invest in sports. We have a learning perk for you to pick up anything that you want to learn. We have a perk uh, for you that let's say if you're getting married, we have some allowance for you. If you have a baby, we have allowance for you. If you're buying your first house, we have allowance for you. If it's your birthday, we reward you with something. Uh, we have a budget for you to bring your family out for, for dinner. Uh, we have 24 categories of this to the extent sometimes I don't even remember. right? But the condition is that you cannot mix the values of these budgets together. So I can't say that, oh, I'm going to bundle everything worth $20,000. I'm just going to go on a one week or one month long Europe trip. You can't. So, so to claim it, you really need to bring your family out for dinner. And then we pay for the bill. If you are sp spending time with your family, you need to show us that you're spending time with your family. And that's how you actually get the rewards, the company. So if you don't do it, you basically cannot claim, right? But what we have found is that people are very inclined to claim. Even if they don't do sporting events, you know, they are, I'm not very active, they will somehow buy a running shoe, right? Because <laughs> they want to claim the money, they want to access that, right? So I think it's a combination of some of these things that uh, encourages people to buy into the culture and why are we even doing this in the first place? Nice, nice. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm totally like, wow. This is like really like, it, it's sort of like you gamify the whole thing. Well, well, in order for them to claim something, that's like, you know, like people always want to uh, uh, collect items, right? So I think it's very interesting. I think it's the mindset again. It still comes back to the mindset, uh, and it's not easy to 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 be consistent on this, right? And you have to also be creative on it as well, right? Mm. Um, um, comparing again, comparing your company size and uh, big company, right? Like corporate, like really big, like for example, IBM or uh, Google or you know all these big brands, right? Um, so what do you, what what are the what what would be the? I mean, you have mentioned some of them, but would would there be any specific key differences between uh, corporate cultures in small business and big businesses? Based on your understand, uh, based on your opinion, <clears throat> sure. I think fundamentally, they all want to achieve very similar things. I mean, every company, every good company that considers culture, usually has very good intention, right? Because if we look at the culture statements of every company, whether it's a tech startup, an SME, or even a corporate company like IBM, one or this, it all means good. It's all to the productivity of the company, it's to the growth of the team members. So I think fundamentally. Uh, that's consistent. But I think the main difference here is the ability to implement some of these cultures, some of these things within the guidebook, some of these things on the wall. That becomes a lot more complex. I mean, it's, it, it's no-brainer to consider that, look, if IBM has 3,000 people sitting in Cyberjaya, it's very difficult to get them, all of them, to buy in. Right? 3,000 people versus 30 people, 
the game is totally different, right? 30 people, you can, let's say, just go for a retreat, do something, and for some town halls, you know, put in a program, and people will buy in and talk about it. But to get 3,000 people to go through the same thing, that's a totally different story, right? So I think the whole idea here, you brought out the word mindset, which is very important here, because again, to influence the mindset of 30 versus 3,000 is going to be very, very uh, different, which is why from the very beginning, this is what we did, and we always encourage you know, the younger startups to do the same as well. It doesn't matter if you're a man of two-person, three-person, or five-person team. You need to already start culture building in that size. Because if you can't build it at, a, at the three-man team or the five-man team, you cannot build it at a 10-man team, 30-man team, 50 people, 1,000 people man team. It will be even worse. People think it's easier, you know, they say they put it aside to say, oh yeah, it's fine, you know, when we grow and we really hire people, that's what we do. But the problem is that when you started hiring people, you as the founder or you as the leadership team, you, you have a lot of things to do, right? a lot of things to consider as well, uh, and a lot of things to learn at, a, at, at, at the same time. And all these things will just park culture building as not just secondary, but tertiary on your list which is the exact same problem that bigger corporates are facing, right? They've grown so far, there's a lot of layers. Nothing wrong with that, that's part of scale and growth, right? But they reach a layer where maybe the person that came out with the culture is up here. It could be the CEO, it could be somebody else at the top. But the, the, the responsibility of ensuring culture happens is somewhere down the line on a culture manager or the HR or the learning department that is far down the chain. And this person is just giving the responsibility of disseminating information. And again, disseminating is so much information to so many people where it's something where you yourself have probably not experienced because you're hired in to do the job, right? You have not went through the process yourself. That's going to be very difficult to rally a bunch of people with uh, the same mindset. So I think the main difference here, it's literally not culture in itself, but getting the people to buy in. That is the biggest challenge and also the biggest difference between a smaller size company and somebody as big as uh, IBM. Right. So you also mentioned about um, the differences of like, even though starting, if you can't, if you can't even have the, 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 the right culture or so-called, you know, the right mindset uh, when in a five-man team or three-man team, right, you can't get it, you can't scale it on, right? So with that, right, what would be the, uh, what, 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 I mean, to, uh, to you, I mean, of course, to me, I don't think there is, but to you as a business owner or a founder or, 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 or leader, right, um, do you think there is such a thing as the right culture for small businesses? Likewise, I don't <laughs> think there is the right culture, right? Uh, because <laughs> because the, the thing is that the culture fit is, the def definition of culture fit is so different uh, and is influenced by so many factors. And even if you take away all the other external factors, you take away where you grew up, your education, what job uh, environment you came from, your educational background, your family background, your basic needs and wants, even if you take away all of these things, right, you still have the people element because people drives culture. And everybody has a different, entire different make in their brains and it's impossible to create the best. So I think the, our own experience in bringing the best that we have to Hong Kong already shows that it does not work. Because to us here, it's like, it's a no-brainer. We put all these systems in place, it's tried and tested, you know, it's almost bulletproof. Obviously, it's not like 100%, but we are very confident. Like, look, we have 20, 20 people back then, Everybody is so invested in the culture. Hey, Hong Kong, you have to do this, man. This is your recipe for growth. It didn't grow. Right? People were so frustrated. People were so irritated. People are questioning and we're like, why, why, why? You don't you like these things, you know? And, 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 and that shows that there is no right recipe to it, right? So sure, there may be some fundamental things that a company 
may want to address. Like again, it's the common things that, oh, we need to be maybe profit driven. We need to make sure that we bring in the right talent. Maybe, you know, this could be fundamental things, but to implement it, the definition of it, the description of it, that changes from situation to situation. Uh, therefore, yeah, I don't think there's any company can say, even you take Google or Facebook, right? That has the, wow, leading world. Yeah, company yeah, yeah. All that. yeah. Try implementing it lock, stock, barrel in a Malaysian startup. It will fail. <laughs> agreed, agreed. Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, so with, with your working experience um, and dealing with clients, right? Um, are there any specific, uh, specific kind of uh, patterns that you noticed um, are people overly formal at the beginning and then not enough after a while? Um, that's, that's one of it. And the second part of it would be, do you, um, do certain industry have fixed behaviors? I think this is more like, it can be, it can go both ways. It can basically be like when your, 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 your teammates come in, they're very smart, uh, very like very like oh let's do it you know and then after that after a while it's sort of like like a roller coaster like, right mm. and then on the client side as well you know some new clients might be very um, uh, overwhelmed with the culture that or the way the, your your team members uh, communicated with them right and after a while they become very you know so so what what's your what's your what what do you notice is there any different pattern or is there a specific pattern that's a very interesting question, especially for the first part when it involves clients. Because I, to be honest, I never really thought about that before. So when you were ex asking me the question, I'm trying to reflect with all my past client explanations, right? And uh, what I realize right now is that our clients are, to some extent, unaffected by our culture, right? So what I realize is that clients are affected with how we perform the outcome of the culture so they very rarely we see them overwhelmed very rarely we will start getting questions about how we behave and whatnot so i think that's a good sign but whenever there is a feedback or a complaint is usually of the performance side of things so when it comes out to the actual work and deliverable right but what i also experience is that we have clients that actually came up to me you know so they met the team members and then they call me separately and, hey Jen uh well your team members all dress very well huh? and and it's it's something we take pride in you know because uh in open minds we also have a fashion budget you are supposed to dress up and we pay for you to dress up right and uh clients like that right so clients actually come and say hey, they dress very well uh looks professional, looks good, you know. Uh, of course, work needs to matter also. La, but there's certain output of the culture that influences uh, the relationship with the client. So when we go into pictures, when, especially in the early stages, this is very evident that sometimes we do stand out uh, from other companies out there because you will notice that in some companies, in the corporate, they always show up with suit and tie. You go into startups, they'll always be in a startup t-shirt with some sometimes with jacket without jacket no the, the, the style is very similar but here we pay attention to a lot of uh, individuality that fulfills certain criteria so it makes us unique in that sense you know but when it comes to internal team the roller coaster is real the roller coaster is very real because what we found is that despite all these systems all these structures all these good things that i've been sharing with you for the past 30 40 minutes earlier right it's very nice and exciting in the beginning. But as you go along, the plateau is caused by a few things. One, you need to invest in the culture. And this is the biggest barrier that many people have. You know, many people subscribe to the idea of the culture and it sounds great, wow, perfect, man. But for me to embrace these values and to do it, it's tough. Because you need to remind yourself, hey, these are the eight things I need to be doing. This is how we, it's a whole rewiring every day you step into office, how you communicate. And sometimes we as humans today, we just don't feel like it, you know. I'm a bit emo today, leave me be, you know, what togetherness, just leave me at my corner, don't talk to me, you know. <laughs> Things like that do happen and when you get irritated, 
maybe it's a client work, maybe it's deadlines, maybe it's something happened along the way to office, you, you change your behavior a little bit. And that's against culture. And some, some, there's just too many human elements. And maintaining it is a challenge. That's one. Number two, the plateau also happens when people, when we realize that people start to have a app, they, they, uh, they develop immunity towards this thing. You know, they start taking things uh, for granted. Like, yeah, it's supposed to be like that. You know, from excitement to taking it for granted. Somehow when I said this, right, it re it, the, the only illustration that come to me is like as though you're in a relationship, right? In the beginning, it's like, whoa, so lovey-dovey. After a while, you just started thinking, yeah, it's supposed to be like that. You know, yeah, you're supposed to think that way. You're supposed to say that. Uh, the, the, the level of effort and emotions have dwindled as well. These two elements that comes in really generates that uh, roller coaster. So as much as we implement structures to maintain as much as we can, this is a constant challenge that we have also been facing uh, over all the years. Um, with uh, what you just shared, um, because personally, I'm, I'm a hospitality background. So I actually used to work in hotels and uh, intern in hotels as well. So five, five star uh, uh, branded hotels. Um, culture is very, very, uh, sometimes culture in, in a hotel or the corporate culture, it can actually affect uh, an individual on your day to day, which means what I meant was that is like, even though I no longer work for the hotel, mm. the way I talk, the way I speak, the way I present myself, it still uh, is, has be, be, it became part of me. It's like ingrained, right? Yeah. So it's like even a choice of word, you know. Um, I never worked with Ritz Carlton, but I interned two months in Ritz Carlton, Kuala Lumpur. That was like about 12 years ago, I guess. Um, but just that two months, it changed the, the choice of word that I use. That people always say thank you, and you will normally say, "Ah, it's okay, no worries," uh, or "You're welcome," right? But in Ritz Carlton, the brand standards at that point, it's um, it's uh, my pleasure. Mm -hmm. You know, so 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 the choice of words will change, and and ever since it's like, you know, when people say thank you, I say my pleasure, or you reply, it's my pleasure, you know. Uh, you use this kind of word. So for your company, have you observed uh, yourself or your, your very close uh, senior management team? Uh, like when you guys are out in a casual, do you see any uh, small little things that is actually, um, it's actually from the corporate culture or you know them before and after? There is, there is. Uh, I totally resonate with uh, what you've just shared. Because even, like you said, even fundamentally on a language level, uh, we have seen changes, right? Some people that have came in from other companies, they brought in languages that are not promoted at all within our workspace. Uh, they have changed dramatically in the way they speak, in the way they express themselves, which is something they're looking for. In terms of the mindset, because Open Minds have always set out to be quite educational in nature, where I'm sure you're aware we have Open Academy, we do a lot of trainings, we mentor a lot of startups, right? This has somehow created some sort like a soft spot for startups in a lot of our team members. So when you talk to them about startups and you talk to them about helping out, you know, there's always this sense of, yeah, sure, why not? And this happens uh, very common uh, in our conversations uh, day to day. All right. So, so one last part that I would like to, it's just my, my, my curiosity. Mm. Uh, besides your team member or your colleagues, right? Have you also observed your client, your regular clients? Did you observe maybe uh, the before and after they work with you guys? Did you... Just out of my curiosity. <laughs> Before and after, in what sense? In the in a, in a sense of like, when you first met this client, they deal with you, in, the, the way they talk to you or the way they deal or the, the ah. way they do things, it's like that, right? And after a few rounds, because they are your, they are your regular customers, so mm. after a few rounds, do you observe that their, mm. their, 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 their behavior and also the way they carry uh, themselves, you know, even though they are your client, but they're not your, 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 
they are not your from your company that mm. they're your clients do you see any changes i mean just my curiosity because we're talking about corporate culture yep. because sometimes corporate culture might affect you know uh the people that you mingle with around mm. like day to day or you know so the answer is yes but very very minimal very very minimal because i think i still come back to the point where yes uh, you see certain influence on clients where they start to respect you for certain standards that you set or how would you perform certain things or how you treat them uh, but in the client and consultant relationship we often see that at the end it's mostly about the work lah, right so the, the work will cover so a lot of conversations will still be around the work and all that although we will see that there's a certain form of gratitude or understanding towards the things that we do however we do see uh changes or we hear of changes of the families of our team members so the people that stay with their siblings their parents that actually see a change and tell us of this change it's quite interesting because at open mind sometimes we do meet with our it's, okay sounds like a school right now you know but sometimes <laughs> we do spend a bit of effort and time to meet up with the parents of the people that were with you know especially during special celebrations i would send something to the home have a quick chat and all that and get quick feedback and we hear very positive things of how they are at home how a certain mindset has changed how this job make their kids happier and things like that uh, and it's i think all results uh, from the culture that i've been talking about as well all right all right that's very uh, that's very good to know and i think definitely you guys have done something that's correct and um and imagine that what you just mentioned all these um i i take it as um success stories uh uh what whatever you guys have uh, planned out and and executing them and being consistent uh, uh carrying out this whole uh, practice right mm -hmm. um what general improvements do you think companies need to make in order to have a better work place culture especially um you know we all know in Malaysia, our work, I mean, the work culture is very different, right? Mm. Uh, some are very uh, strict until like, you know, and then some are super like now the young generation, they are very flexy and everything. So so what, what would be the, the improvement do you think companies need to make in order to have a better workplace culture? Mm. So what I really think uh, it's, it's nothing special. You've probably heard of it a million times by now. But I really think that the first improvement has to always happen uh, from the top. It goes all the way back to the, the senior managers. It goes all the way back to the founder or CEO, even the leadership team, to really have make a decision that they will want to be aware of this current situation. I think that is fundamental. Before any change or steps that have been in place, because the first step is to be able to listen to what's happening on the ground. Some companies, very sad to say, they don't even know who just stepped into the door. They don't know what their needs, what their background, what's the make or their organization. Everybody, when they go in, they're given a title, but nobody considers the people behind the titles. And that is the first step for any improvement to take place. Because even you talk about Gen Z or, or millennials and all of that, sure, these are different generations that grew up differently, their lifestyle, their expectations are a little bit different. But if you strip off again the description, right, you can't say that they all want very different things. You can't say that because a millennial or even a Gen X will probably tell you the same thing. They want a better working environment. Like they want people to respect each other. Don't tell me the boomers don't care. Right? I want people to scold me. It's okay, scold me. I can scold you back. No, not something, right? They want a workplace that is harmonious. They want a workplace that is comfortable and safe for people to work. Then you bring about things like maybe salary. They want to be paid well. They want to be recognized of their efforts. They want to be rewarded when reward is due. They want opportunities to grow. Every generation has very similar aspects, but the description is different. And the description can only be found when top management actually has the mindset to say, okay, let's listen, right? How, how do we do this? I think that would be the first step to many steps to come because after that, then structures can be put in place. Uh, new 
SOPs and processes can be designed, new reward mechanism on your words, gamification can come in, you know, and all this is based on because now you know who you're working with. All right. Thank you so much, Jen, for sharing your, your journey and also the, uh, the whole corporate culture of open minds. Um, it's, it's really an honor to have you here with us. And uh, I learned so much. And, and definitely, there are a lot more that we are able to look into, especially with this, this period of time that is uh, very, uh, quite, quite uh, um, stressful for some companies and also some uh, employees as well. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, some uh, leaders are also trying very hard to think of how can they motivate their, their, their teammates and how to uh, uh, bring everyone together because now is really a tough time, right? Um, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Jen, for your sharing. And to all the audience who are still with us now, um, this is the Q&A session. So if you have any question uh, that you want to ask um, Jen, don't be shy to ask. Uh, we will pull up the question and then uh, we will have Jen to answer those questions. So um, we have a few questions here. So. Um, one of the questions is, uh, has there been any values you tried to implement that didn't work with the culture you are trying to set out? If yes, how did you overcome it? This one is very interesting because um, personally, my, my approach towards any form of work, including culture, is that I always believe there is a way to make it happen. Right, it's, but it's just about how you get there. So even though from an initial stage, it could be something where it's totally counter-culture, but after feedback, after taking in input, after speaking to the people, listening, somehow this certain aspect of this would be able to uh, fit in to some sense. For example, one of the more counter-culture things that we had at one point of time was actually implementing very strict SOPs. We started off very free, as with every startup, right? We, are, we have this illusion that oh, we don't need rules, we don't need this, we don't need that. We can just base it on hustle and hard work and somehow things will work out. But as the company grows, processes and SOPs need to be in place. And when this was introduced, although it sounds so simple, right? The pushback from the team was enormous. It's like, why can't I do it like before? Like genuinely, why can't I do it like before? It's been working, right? I've been here for the past four years. It works. Why do you need to tell me right now that I need to do it in such... Why do I need templates right now? Why do I need a checklist, you know? All these questions starts coming out. And the, but the thing is that as the founder of the leadership team, again, that's why the, I started off by talking about the foundation, right? What is the company trying to achieve with culture? So how we do it is that when we see that, no, this SOP thing is important. The implementation of processes is important because this is what the company is built upon. This is the foundation. This helps us get further. If that justifies, then it's all about just finding ways to make sure the team members are able to accept the implementation of this new thing, this so-called countermeasure. But if it's something that's being introduced, that is totally against our foundation, then there's something we won't even consider. That's why the basis is very important. That's why it's very, uh, I keep using the word important, sounds like a broken record, but I can't find <laughs> word. But, but it's, I think it's really, that there needs to be a focus on how culture cannot just be built on the bells and whistles. Because if it's being implemented as a bells and whistles, you are not able to address why do you need it. And when you don't have that why, then it wouldn't work. Because you keep getting pushed back, right? Why should we do this? Why shouldn't we do that? I have a better way. Do you consider this? In what situation? Right? So, so I think, yes, there are definitely a lot of times where there are certain counter-cultural things that we try to be implemented. Some of it are totally filtered out. Some of them... Because it relates, it resonates, uh, we always find ways to implement it, sometimes in stages. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that um, answer. Um, next question we have, were there any aspects of corporate culture that you and the team specifically tried, and, uh, tried to prevent? 
such uh, such as uh, Malaysian employees being discouraged from discussing salary or using very roundabout language in emails under the the guise of uh, professionalism. Uh, what advice would you give to young folks that feel like they want to change culture at companies they work at? I mean, these are two separate questions, sorry. Yeah, sure. So for the first aspect, there is quite a number. The email one is spot on. We absolutely didn't like the email ones. In fact, we actually school the team members that comes in when it comes to email. You cannot send an email like that. I don't understand what you're talking about. And we, we totally bar that out. We also discourage very long meetings. right? So we always uh, encourage meetings to only be 45 to 60 minutes. Uh, at one point of time, we actually have a, a, a timer at every meeting so that everybody's aware of the time and everybody needs to be short and succinct. Uh, we also try to, to uh, not, or rather we try to change the culture by saying that we only need to come into office three days a week. I think that's one of the biggest moves they've made and we have a shorter in-office period. So every week from Monday to Friday, you only come in three days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesdays and Thursdays are out of office, right? And among all these days, your official working hours are 11 to 6, which is shorter than a typical work hours as well. Uh, this alone was to contend against a corporate culture of 9 to 5 every day check into office. Um, and this is something that we prevent. And we were very intentional with this because, again, we have a foundational reason and purpose and why for it. So among the years, right, we do have team members that come in why I can't go to office? I want to go to office. Now, in the normal corporate situation, it's a come, come, come. Why not? Right? Please stay in office 24 hours. I don't care. You know, even better. <laughs> but you know what we do? We lock the office. So even if you decide to drive to the office, there is a padlock that only the founders have. You can't even step in. Just go somewhere else, please. So there are things like that. Yeah, it's a bit funny. Sometimes, sometimes when you think about it, we are quite drastic also, uh, some of our implementation. But it's all for good reason, right? And yeah, so here are some of the things that, uh, that we do. it. But one of the points that I think Johan brought out regarding discussing salary and stuff, uh, I think that is beyond culture. So I think that has kind of become like a Malaysian thing. Somehow, we have tried one thing to because one of our values is transparency, right? So we tell our team members that, look, if there's anything at all, literally just come and talk to us, be open, work or regard, not regarding work. If you, something you're struggling with, something you're unhappy with, something that I said that hurt you, uh, talk to us. And some of us sit among the team members. We do everything that we could to have an open door policy, whatever that you name it. But somehow, people are still not wanting to be transparent. That people still don't want to talk about it now. If you ask me, that is the biggest nut we are still trying to crack uh, nine years in. We are still asking ourselves, how can we get them to be more transparent? How can we get them to see us? Yes, we are your bosses, but at the same time, we need to have these conversations. And that comes down to the, the second question, right? Where uh, what advice will I give to people who wants to change uh, the thing? Well, I think there are different ways, but nothing beats having a conversation. But the struggle is this. For a conversation to happen, both sides need to be open. Both sides need to be transparent. I know some companies, they organize events, you know, to say, okay, now you all can propose what you want to change within the company. <laughs> you know, right? that's, that's, that's typical corporate company yeah, style. Yeah, man. correct, correct. I've... Uh, I've participated in a few of those as a mentor and all that. So sometimes I honestly shake my head, you know, and uh, there's, a, there's a suggestion box, you know, where people write into the intranet and try to put in what they feel of improvement. I mean, sure, some companies take it seriously, some companies not. Uh, but what I feel honestly is that conversations need to take place. So you as a young person or whoever that wants to uh, change, I would say you also need to kind of validate that change first. Right? So the same startup mindset, you test it out on your own, it's validated. Right now, you do it with your team. See how this impacts your fellow team members as well. Does it, gives you the, does it give them the same result that it's been giving you? Because again, uh, culture is not let's buy more beanbags. 
<laughs> right? So if it impacts work, let's see how this, let's say if it's really a beanbag even, right? How this beanbag actually really positively changes the way you approach work. And after that, your team members. Now, if it really works out fine, then now you can have an open conversation with the higher ups, your senior managers, your directors, your founders, and whatnot. Say, hey, look, we have been doing this, you know, for the past three to six months. It's been positive, and they're more likely to listen that way rather than just walking up to a manager and say, hey, you know, Google giving free food. I think we should give free food too. It will boost motivation. Like, oh. and also, and also, Google got the eighty to eighty percent, twenty percent work uh, JD. <laughs> ah, yeah, correct, right? To, to work yeah, on your yeah. passion and all that. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, it's going to be very different. And if you're really trying to inspire change, you need to make sure that change is worth pursuing in the first place. If you can validate that, you have uh, real stories to tell, then sure, bring that up, have the conversations. But again, it takes two hands to clap. If your managers or directors are not willing to listen, then unfortunately, your hands are also quite tight in an organization. Uh, one last there's really two questions. One is from Johan and one is from myself um, because I think uh, these are the two questions that we are going to take. Um, we, are, uh, we are going to wrap up the session. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on employee advocacy? Uh -huh. I know this topic has a lot of debates going on, <laughs> but my personal take is that I'm all for employee uh, advocacy. I think it's... Okay, let me backtrack a little bit. Yes, that is my, my stand. But the reason for this then is that companies, you like it or not, right? Some level of employee advocacy is already happening. You can't stop it because of how social media is. I mean, just think about how we complain or compliment our favorite restaurants. Our favorite restaurant could just be a burger guy across the street that does not have a social media platform. But we talk about it. We are kind of advocating certain things, right? Same goes to within a company. You will talk about it. You will talk about your bosses. You will talk about what's going on over there. No, I know you sign an NDA and all that kind of thing, but you come back, you complain to your wife in your catch-up sessions, your friends, you talk about how good or how bad your boss is. Advocacy is already happening. The thing is that when companies make a deliberate move to bar this from happening from social media, it's as good as you running a restaurant, but you decide to unpublish your Facebook page because you're scared people are giving reviews about you. It does not work, right? So I stand on saying that yes, companies should promote this or should accept this because like it or not, this is also a way for a company, not just on a negative side to receive feedback and address it openly, but it's a good way to also promote all the good that's happening within the company. Instead of putting, barring it, place guidelines to tell people, look, you can share, right? Sure, bad or good share, but make sure certain things you don't share. Like you don't reveal your clients, don't reveal privileged information and things like that. You know, putting guidelines to govern that. But I think moving forward, uh, companies that are still having control over employee advocacy will eventually lose this. We have seen it happen in the past five to 10 years. We can't stop it, right? You search for any company, you'll find something somewhere lah. Right? And with more social media platforms going out, you literally will lose control. So I think it's better to embrace it, put guidelines if you have to, uh, because this is how communication is going to be anyway moving forward in the next decade. So yeah, I guess that's what they say is true, right? If you can't beat them, join them. This is one, <laughs> this is one good uh, example to that as well. All right. Thanks, Jen. Thank you for all the uh, amazing questions that, uh, I mean, amazing answers that you answered to all those questions that we have. And um, we are towards the end of the session. Um, <clears throat> once again, um, thank you very much for uh, Jen being here with us and also all the audiences uh, here with us, uh, spending uh, a, a one hour plus uh, on a weekday with us. Um, and before wrapping up, uh, I we have this uh, rapid fire uh, session for Jen. Mm -hmm. um, so, pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Yay. All right. Four seasons or tropical climate? Four seasons, anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Would you rather text or call? Text. 
self-driving car or self-cooking kitchen? Self-cooking kitchen, any day. Please, self-washing too, if possible. <laughs> <laughs> all right, that's all for today. And uh, once again, really, uh, it's really a pleasure to have Jen Wong, uh, founder of Open Minds, uh, being here with us, sharing his um, uh, journey, uh, his uh, thoughts and opinions on corporate culture uh, for small businesses as well, uh, as, well as uh, medium-sized uh, uh, medium businesses, all right?